Um, so this is going to be a, uh, a fairly informal presentation. It's nothing too academic. It's going to be an introduction to uh, Amistad National Recreation Area, talking a little bit about the Amistad Reservoir, uh, a little bit of an intro to Lower Pecos Canyonlands archaeology, and then kind of a little bit about kind of cultural resources program here at the park and uh, what I do on the good days when I'm not just checking email and uh, doing the, the uh, office nonsense. So um, here we go. So um, Amistad National Recreation Area is a unit of the National Park Service. We're located just uh, northwest of Del Rio. Um, we have this funny boundary. You know, most parks have uh, fairly regular polygons for boundaries. We have the 1144.3 foot elevation contour along 540 miles of shoreline on the U.S. side of the reservoir. Um, so uh, we are on the border with Mexico. We go uh, 83 miles up the Rio Grande. We go about 20, 25 miles up the Devil's River and about 15 miles up the Pecos River. We share border with Seminole Canyon State Park and with the southern unit of Devil's River State Natural Area that's not open to the public yet. But there was a field school out there for TAS not too long ago. Um, reservoir is here for flood control and for uh, water storage for irrigation down in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Um, every time they release water going downstream for irrigation, uh, both countries generate power off of it. There are hydroelectric plants on the U.S. side and the Mexican side. And so if, if they're going to release, say, you know, 100 units of water, uh, 50 units of that goes through the U.S. hydro plant and 50 units goes through the Mexican hydro plant and everybody gets power. Um, you know, most people think of us as a bass fishing lake and boating, um, but, you know, recreation is number four on the list. And, uh, you know, and so everybody wishes that the lake would stay high and full all the time, but that's, that's really not what it's for, which is always a bummer for those of us that like to look at pretty water, but it is what it is. A um, little bit of history of the reservoir. So there was a 1944 water treaty with Mexico calling for a creation of a series of reservoirs along the Rio Grande. Then in 1954, Hurricane Alice came in at Brownsville, came straight up the Rio Grande and dropped between 37 and 43 inches of rain in an area that normally gets about 14 inches annual average. And uh, Pecos River came up uh, between like 86 or 96 feet uh, that flowed into the Rio Grande, which came up about 60 feet, which uh, blew through the international bridge between Del Rio and our sister city, Acuna, in Mexico, and um, massive loss of life and property on both sides of the reservoir. Same thing, Eagle Pass and Piedras Negras downstream of us. And so they knew they were going to create a dam um, upstream of Del Rio and downstream of where the Devil's River flowed into the Rio. So um, 1958, first uh, archaeological surveys began. Uh, 1965, uh, National Park Service begins actively managing the land and the recreation and the resources uh, on the new to be reservoir. The dams completed 68, 69, and then 1990, the land, which was owned by International Boundary and Water Commission, which is part of the U.S. State Department, um, most of it, except for the dam itself and some administrative areas, were handed over to National Park System. And so we've got about 57,000 acres of parkland. Um, lake is always going up and down. Um, what is this? Uh, 2010, we uh, hit our second highest peak ever, uh, almost about 1130 feet above sea level. And then uh, 2013, we dropped to our uh, record low of about 1056. And we'll, we're everywhere in between. You can see it looks like we're, you know, we'll have about five years or so where we're high and then five years or so where we're low and it kind of comes in chunks. And then you'll see it spike uh, when we get tropical storms and hurricanes and things hit. Makes uh, managing the campgrounds and boat ramps a bit of a challenge. Uh, never mind uh, some archaeological site management issues I can go into in questions later. Um, so, yeah, so here we are. We've got the the, the Rio Grande, the Pecos River, and the Devil's River coming up here, all coming through. Uh, Rio Grande is uh, fairly muddy. This is uh, 
older picture, we can kind of see where from the reservoir is high. This is, you know, bank to bank uh, actual reservoir. But in this picture, it's, it's a little bit lower. The, um, this feature here on the left, uh, if y'all can see my, my little cursor moving, is the old 1883 uh, railroad bed from the Second Transcontinental Railway, uh, very close to where the Silver Spike was driven, where you had the mostly uh, uh, Chinese crews working from the West, meeting the mostly Irish and Italian crews working from the East and uh, completing that. And that was just a couple of miles west of where the Pecos flows into the Rio Grandes, which would be oh, kind of off over here, kind of in the top right of the screen in that, that corner. So neat area, all kinds of uh, you know, prehistory as well as uh, historical archeology span out there. Um, the Pecos uh, is flowing clear, uh, largely spring fed uh, through these uh, beautiful deep canyons. And uh, the Devils is doing much of the same. It's spectacular, rugged country. Um, so, you know, the region's what archaeologists call the Lower Pecos Canyon lands. And uh, ecologically, we're where the Chihuahuan Desert meets the Texas Hill Country, the Ed Edwards Plateau meets the Tamaulipan Thorn Scrub of the South Texas Brushlands. Um, so, besides having the convergence of the three rivers, we've got a convergence of these three ecological zones. And then this map, you can also kind of really see the uplift here of the Balcones Escarpment. And um, kind of related to that, we have a lot of uh, springs. So in fact, like the third and fourth largest springs in Texas are here in Valverde County. Uh, San Felipe Springs is the water supply for Del Rio and then uh, Good Enough Springs, which is underneath the reservoir is uh, number four. Um, uh, characteristic vegetation and also just a plug for our nature trails. If you guys are looking for a place to come out and take a hike and look for birds, we've got 291 birds on our uh, bird checklist for the park. And this is what it would normally look like in spring. Um, it's a lot browner and deader than that right now, but um, it's, a, it's a pretty place when it wants to be. Um, picture I lifted from Texas Beyond History, just kind of showing some of the kind of the northeastern corner of the county gets a little bit more rainfall and also kind of underscoring this tension between grasslands and brushlands that, um, you know, today it's mostly brush, but with uh, Native American land management practices, more, more fire and uh, less overgrazing and less suppression of wildfires would have been a little bit more tipped towards brush. Um, I mentioned the springs. This is good enough spring. I'm sorry, it's not good enough springs. This is um, Indian Springs. Up on the Devil's River, anyone with a boat uh, can get up there from the Rough Canyon boat ramp. It's about eight miles above the boat ramp. And it's these beautiful springs just gushing out of the side of the cliff. I'll come back to Indian Springs on um, another slide later on. Um, again, most people know us for fishing, um, but uh, we actually do have, you know, besides these uh, ESPN 200, 300 boat tournaments, um, we've got some pretty cool rock art and uh, rock shelters with, uh, with uh, cool perishable stuff that I'll talk about. Um, we're a little bit unusual for National Park Service areas and we have five hunting areas with bow hunting for deer and uh, uh, shotgun for uh, uh, waterfowl and things. Um, but you know the abundant game was also important back in the day and uh, we got you know 13,000 odd years of uh, human occupation and cool stuff going on. Folks out here were always hunter-gatherers, no crops, no villages, no permanent houses, um, just doing the desert hunter-gatherer thing, always moving around, um, living in dry rock shelters, also uh, upland camps. Um, I mentioned uh, 1958 archeological surveys and then a decade of archeological work done afterwards. Um, you know, it created uh, about 875,000 artifacts in the park's collections which are stored at Tarl in Austin. We've got our nice little Indiana Jones Tarl repository uh, picture there. And um, a picture on the top left is Arenosa Shelter. Uh, wonderful exhibit on Texas Beyond History about Arenosa Shelter. Um, and you can see how high up above the Pecos this was when it was being excavated. Now that shelter is entirely buried beneath silt from the reservoir um, up, up to up above the top of, the, of the, the deposits there. Uh, Panther Cave, uh, one of the most important rock art sites in North America. And I will just add on that, we recently, uh, just this January, received National Historic Landmark status from the Department of the Interior. So um, 
now, uh, hopefully, uh, that'll help with uh, getting some project funding and help get the word out just how how impressive these resources are. Um, Pecos River style pictographs only found here in the lower Pecos three to 4,000 years old for the most part, um, but a fairly impressive uh, range of dates there. Uh, and Panther Cave is accessible by boat uh, in a normal year, but uh, this year the water is too far down and uh, you actually cannot get to it presently. But um, it's kind of segues into, uh, okay, yeah, so here is my uh, National Historic Landmark slide. Um, most of my work is not dealing with cool rock art, though I, I do, uh, you know, compliant stuff. That's the main reason the park keeps me around is Section 106 stuff, uh, replacing water lines or, um, you know, we're going to install new signs here and there. And so just doing little small pedestrian surveys and dropping shovel tests and things. Um, or every now and then something catches on fire. I mentioned uh, Indian Springs. So on this map, Indian Springs is down kind of in the lower right corner. Um, and then uh, so now again, here in this view, Indian Springs is still down the lower right corner. And then you've got this big burn scar in the distance on the opposite side of the river. And there's one of my work boats parked there. I'm out checking this out. Uh, I'm one of the few people in the park with uh, mapping and GIS software in my office. So I get called out to map things and also survey the burn scars, make sure there wasn't any archaeology that was harmed. And in this case, there was no archaeology harmed. Uh, basically, it just burned the, uh, the little cover of Bermuda off the top. But while I was out there, documented a lot of backcountry uh, campsites and people building uh, uh, ground fires. Um, so, you know, Public service announcement: Please don't don't build ground fires. Uh, we're switching over for uh, for backcountry camping stuff to using uh, fire pans and uh, that kind of thing to contain to keep fires contained and uh, try not to let them spread. Uh, I don't think this particular fire ring was uh, what caused the uh, this particular fire, but uh, you know these fire rings will stay on the ground for decades and decades and decades, and every now and then they accidentally get reported as archaeological sites. Um, so it was part of what I was doing was photographing and GPSing each one so we can come back and try to disperse them later before they uh, can enter the archaeological record. Um, but uh, yeah, also too, when you build a big fire on the ground, it'll sterilize the seed bank and all the microbes in the soil and you wind up with this big ugly dead spot that'll stay for years. So um, I'll plug for public lands. While I was out checking all that, uh, I noticed there in the bottom left corner, somebody graffitied the rock next to Indian Springs where I'd parked my boat. So went out and documented that and passed that on to law enforcement and uh, maintenance to get that cleaned up. So never a dull moment. Um, got a report of a site being looted, which I was never able to find or really even verify the report. But while I was looking, I found an undiscovered Pecos River style rock art site. So that was always kind of a dream of mine was to find unrecorded rock art sites. And here's one. So we call it Red Wing Shelter. And um, I'll send you a link at the end of this presentation. Um, you can see a 3D model of this site that Shumla made. So I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so yeah, so that's really kind of a lot of the, the most fun part of my work is when I get to uh, be out in the field discovering new stuff and uh, recording stuff, hanging out with Shumla, especially doing the uh, rock art recording. Here we are at Panther Cave. Um, but like I said, you can't get to Panther Cave. So we had to improvise and actually hike canoes in from the state park. And uh, it was it was challenging. Here we are trying to uh, schlep all of our gear down this uh, fairly vertical goat trail just to get it to the canoes to get to Panther Cave. So some, some challenging logistics, but it's a, it's a good time. Um, or in better circumstances, when it allows, here we are with uh, uh, some law enforcement rangers helping us out with one of their jet boats, heading uh, way up the Rio Grande, documenting rock art in a small rock shelter. Some days are great days to be on the water. Some days it's uh, more challenging, either uh, pea soup fog in, say, early February that you can barely see through, or high winds with two-foot rollers that your little flat bottom boat is bouncing off of, and you, your back hurts for three days after you get off the water. But um, cool stuff. So here's one of those sites. This is a lookout shelter. This is um, kind of on the, the boundary between National Park Service and Seminole Canyon State Park. It's kind of immediately below the overlook. If you're in Seminole Canyon, looking across the canyon to Panther Cave, you're kind of standing kind of right on top of this site. 
and it's got some um, engraved uh, grooves and uh, petroglyphs in uh, uh, in some of the boulders. And there was some faded rock art here that was recorded back in the 60s, but then um, the reservoir came up and touched it and pretty much erased it uh, since the 1980s. But pretty cool site. One of my favorite things here is this, this neat little line of bedrock matates uh, right here. It kind of shows up on the map down here, but um, pretty fun. So usually while Shumla is doing their uh, rock art recording specialty stuff, I'll go out and uh, work on the maps for the sites because that's that's my jam. Um, get to do some cool things. Here's Perita Cave. Uh, did a you know some major you know huge 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 rock shelter on the Rio Grande. Uh, wonderful rock art in the back of it. Uh, took a couple of days of camping out on the Rio Grande Vega in front of the site to finish our documentation. Um, so uh, got some just see some really cool things. You see our, our little camp down here at the left that you don't normally get to see. Um, it was just a, you know with a couple hour site visit, like for example um, here on the left. This is right at sunset, and the shadow of the shelter wall cuts right through the rock art panel, and then the sun sinks behind the canyon on the other side and fades out. So I don't know. Maybe that's on purpose. Maybe that means something. Maybe not. But it's it's pretty cool. Um, and you get to, you know, go up in the canyon and set up your uh, camera and see the Milky Way through the mouth of a rock shelter, which is uh, not a normal thing. Um, Texas Beyond History, a little bit if you want more cool info about uh, this area. And again, I mentioned Arenosa Shelter, um, you know, Texas Beyond, I think this is the old Texas Beyond History uh, front page, but uh, great information about the area there. And then, um, Here's the Sketchfab website, and I didn't mention a whole lot about uh, Shumla's uh, Alexandria project, but um, you know they're trying to record every known rock shelter in Valverde County. Uh, they've recorded well over 200 of them so far, and I've been working with them on the sites that are uh, within or directly neighboring the national park here. And um, so, when part as part of their recording process, they're making. Uh, uh, 3D models using uh, photogrammetry, and they're they're posting a lot of them onto uh, uh, Sketchfab here. And so there's this this digital library of rock art sites they've created on Sketchfab. And so uh, I don't know, let's see, like the second one down here. This is this Alex 22 is Red Wing. That's the site I was telling you that I I stumbled on. Um, so anyway, just all kinds of cool stuff going on, and that's kind of um, you know Lower Pecos in a nutshell, and some of my better days in the Lower Pecos in a nutshell. And um, that's the bulk of what I've got for you. I, I've tried to keep it short. So um, I may have uh, actually kept it shorter than I meant to. So uh, questions, anything? Um, all right, well, thank you, Jack. Um, I, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but um... You know, I'm sure folks will be, uh, you know, thinking of, of, of something and, and they could put something in the chat or, um, or ask you themselves. But I, I have a question, you know, I'm, yeah. um, I'm pretty curious because this is, a, you know, it's a big area and you guys, you manage a lot of resources, very important resources, um, like what you've been showing us here. And, and is, is looting of archaeological sites still uh, quite an issue today? And, um, and, and what do you guys do to prevent that? And, and what are some of the, um, you know, uh, protective measures that aren't just kind of physical, you know, like sure. laws and regulations and things? Sure, sure. Right. So, um, for example, you know, Panther Cave, we have a protective fence around the site. Um, other cases, there will be uh, electronic measures in place. Um, you know, my my favorite thing though is is education and outreach. That you know, if we can reach people and and try to you know get the idea across that that it's important. Yeah, you know, I'd much rather you know talk to somebody and have them come away loving it than uh, have uh, get the damage done and have the law enforcement write them a ticket. You know, it's uh, it's kind of closing the barn door after the horse is out. So. Um, uh, you know, so for instance, I, I volunteer as a tour guide for Seminole Canyon State Park and for the Rock Art Foundation, I guess now the Witte Museum at the White Shaman site. 
So always trying to hit hit the education and outreach really hard. Um, you know, of course, law enforcement patrols, um, and then just you know site monitoring. Trying to spend as much time out there as I can. All right. Um, well, we've got a few questions in the chat here. Um, do you want me to read these and then you you answer them, Jack? Sure. Okay. So, do you have any particular impressions from the rock art in the in Red Wing Shelter? Ooh. Um, one of the things that I love about it is that I mean every every site out here is different and has its own character. One of the really neat things about that site is that you know I mean like most most of the rock shelters with rock art in them out here are rock shelters you know right it's it's a, a overhang relatively shallow overhang it's it's uh you know more broad usually than it is deep you know it's it's, it's, a, it's an overhang rock shelter um red wing was actually a cave 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 uh, a, a karst solutional cavity uh that the canyon eroded into the side of and clipped and kind of opened up and I mean, there's, you know, some formations and things back in there and kind of one of the sort of the fun things about this is so the, the surface that the rock art is painted on in Red Wing is actually not facing out towards the river um, as, as, or, you know, towards the canyon as uh, most of these sites are, but it, it's on a, you know, part of what would have been the, the opposite wall of this paleo cave, you know, facing back towards towards the cliff wall uh don't know if that's significant or not uh these features i'm sorry these features these these figures that are in it um they're, they're familiar i mean if you see a lot of pecos river style figures you'll start to see a lot of these motifs and things um being repeated you know in similar forms and shapes um you know, this is a series of three figures. They've got red wings and these plume things coming out of their heads. It's, it's a neat little small panel, but I mean, the panel's maybe two, maybe three meters across, you know, a meter or so high. It's a fairly small panel. It's not like a Panther Cave 150 foot long thing. Um, it's kind of a, you know, exposed little climb around to get into it. It's not an easy shell to get, it, to get into. There's not a lot of occupational debris there um kind of a neat site um i don't know if that answers the question but it, it's 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 fun i mean and that's that's part of what i you know we really were hoping to get out of shrimless documentation work too is that you know as we record specific fi figures and the uh, different attributes of the specific figures you know then you know looking at uh, correlates and you know okay you know do we have these types of figures in these types of settings do certain types of figures you know, go together or go with particular environments or certain areas, um, you know, and just, you know, what, what are the patterns and then and, and try to figure out what that means. All right, next question. Have you found any bows in any of the caves and how far is this from Baylor Rock Shelter? Ooh, um, I have not found any bows. Um, you know, arrow points, yes, um, but not bows. Uh, the bows have been found. I have not found them personally. Uh, they, they are present in, in the region, I believe. Um, and I'm forgetting exactly where Baylor Rock Shelter is. Do, do we know a trinomial for Baylor? I can, I can um, try to get on my side atlas or something here real quick. But uh, um, I think that it's farther up the Rio Grande, but I'm not positive. Okay. Thought it might be in the northern end, end of your territory there. Uh, yeah, no, this is this is uh, near the Rio Grande. This is um, you know not not too far from say around Box Canyon on the Rio. Speaking in in vague terms, purposefully vague. <laughs> Talking about site protection. <laughs> Good job. Um, all right. How old are the uh, the rock art pictures in in the cave or caves? I guess that you're you're showing here. Sure. So you know we have a range of radiocarbon dates uh, for this region. Uh, the oldest radiocarbon dates are 4,200 BP. The uh, most recent ones are about 1,000 
four sixty five, I think, plus or minus, which is a really remarkable span of time to have the same style of rock art being produced. So you know that's one of the reasons that you know we think it's uh, almost certainly you know religious ceremonial art that you know where there's a, a you know very conservative cultural reason to keep it keep it the same throughout without without a whole lot of room for individual artistic expression. Um, uh, and you'll see a lot of the same figures being again repeated uh, sometimes between different rock shelters. You'll have the same identifiable figures for the same attributes. You know, kind of in the same way that you can identify you know, superheroes, you can tell Spider-Man from Batman, from Captain Marvel uh, versus, uh, you know, you, or you can tell Catholic saints, you know, whatever, based on how they're dressed and what accessories they're holding and that kind of thing. Uh, same kind of thing with the, uh, with these guys. So, you know, we think we're looking at, uh, you know, God, spirits, ancestors, uh, religious art, uh, myths, history, that kind of thing. Um, next question. I spent a week there with Joe Labadee. Long I, is he still around? Unfortunately, he's not. He uh, passed away, uh, I think, last year. Um, but I was an uh, intern for Joe Labadee in 2005. That's what brought me down here. I worked for him for about a year and a half. And um, I, uh, he uh, took me under his wing. And um, uh, I'm, I'm here because of Joe. So... Uh, I'm uh, uh, very feel fortunate to have gotten to work work with him and work work for him. I wish he was still around. I've got so many questions I need to ask him. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And Jack and I were there with Joe Labadee and Panther Cave back in 2005. I remember that vividly. Absolutely. Um, on, oh, let's see. Based on the the number of caves found, uh, is are is there similar art? In multiple caves, uh, do we know the trek of hunter-gatherer migration, for example, north to south, of the people that use the rock shelters? Ooh, I wish. Um, you know, so these guys are, are super mobile. Um, you know, probably picking up and moving camp every couple of days. Uh, probably not sticking around too long. You know. Um, so in terms of like, you know, what the seasonal rounds would have been, you know, it's one of those things where I imagine, you know, if you had some canyons within the region that had, say, like a wonderful supply of walnuts in them, when it was walnut season, that's where you'd be, you know, versus if when the prickly pear tunas are ripe or, uh, you know, whatever particular resource happens to be hitting at that particular time. And so, you know, you'd have these, these small, small bands moving around the landscape following particular resources through the seasons. And then, you know, kind of seasonally aggregating, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, Cabeza de Vaca talks about the folks getting together uh, south of San Antonio for prickly pear harvests. Um, I imagine you'd have certain times where you'd have seasonal aggregations where all these re related family bands would all come together and introduce the young people and trade goods and, and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, in terms of actually trying to work out what those migrations might have been, or you know what the seasonal rounds might have been, what the patterns might have been. Um, hard to say. You know, there's some neat work done uh, by uh, Texas State University in Eagle Cave or uh, Eagle Nest Canyon, uh, side across the canyon from from Eagle Cave. Um, you know, they're you know looking at the volume of firecracked rock produced in that particular site over, you know, the time it was occupied, and I think, you know, based on you know, some experimental studies and how much firecrack rock and ash is produced by one, you know, kind of uh, archetypical earth oven firing, you know, you're looking at like one earth oven firing every year or so on average. And so if you've got 5,000 years of occupation based on your radiocarbon dates and projectile points and stuff, but, you know, only one earth oven every year or so on average, then, you know, they're probably not even coming back to that site every year they're probably coming back every few years and um you know because you, you know like uh, based on some calorie calculations that phil daring did you know you need to have five or six earth ovens per day at 1500 calories per oven uh to feed a band of 25 people about 1500 calories a day so the the math really doesn't work out for like long-term settlements these guys are just you know moving fast and light and you know staying in a, in one place very briefly and then 
uh, you know, not coming back, uh, maybe even for, for a few years. Some of these wild desert plants like Sotol take 15 years to grow to maturity. And so if you're harvesting your mature Sotol, um, you know, you can, you can very easily over harvest your landscape uh, if you stay too long in one place. All right, next question. Uh, do you conduct any archeological outreach to neighboring landowners and communities that might limit site destructions due to pay to dig operations and or local relic hunters? Um, so I have not specifically targeted uh, pay to dig or local relic hunters as a group. That's a, that's a cool idea. Um, you know, I, I do, you know, for, for example, uh, Val Verde County does the, uh, an annual archaeology fair, uh, usually every October. And, uh, you know, I'm always there teaching atlatl and friction fire and rabbit sticks and, you know, maybe some basic uh, ancient life ways kind of things. Um, and I, I always try to hit, you know, site preservation messages uh, when I can work that into that, too. Um, and get the word out that way, but that's a that's a great it's a great question. I, I have not specifically tried to target those folks, except as kind of um, incidental bycatch in my uh, my my general interpretations. You know, if they happen to come into uh, programs I'm giving or uh, you know tours of the the different uh, different sites when I'm, I'm leading tours at Seminole Canyon or, or the White Shaman. But um, I like that. I may have to try to figure out how to approach that without coming across too preachy. Um, all right, next question. What do we know about the mortuary program in the lower Pecos in prehistory? Well, so um, several different things going on, but lots of uh, burials, uh, you know, um, in rock shelters and sinkholes. Uh, folks were often um, bundled, uh, often flexed, um, we've got burials going back for thousands and thousands of years. Um, what do I want to say? Um, you know, sometimes, uh, like for instance, uh, infants might be found, uh, wrapped up in, uh, soft rabbit fur robes, uh, laid into baskets, uh, that kind of thing. Um, Dental health is uh, poorer among this population than a lot of other uh, hunter-gatherers. You know, you normally you think about the hunter-gatherer dental health being better than that of agricultural folks, but uh, because of all the grit and also all the, the sugar in these baked uh, plants like uh, Sotol and Lechigia, um, you know, of course, that's what, you know, because you can uh, ferment and, uh, you, know, you know, ferment that kind of stuff into uh, Tesuino and you can uh, distill that into Sotol and, uh, you know, mezcal kind of stuff. But, um, you know, so lots, lots of sugar in these, and then everything is processed with stone, uh, ground stone. So um, kind of uh, surprisingly poor, poor dental health. I don't know if that answers the question well enough. Um, all right, next question. You talked about the hunter-gatherer lifestyle and lack of farming sedentism. How long are some of the occupations of the rock shelters? Do you think folks are coming back here routinely? Yes, I do. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the rock art fits into some of those, uh, you know, recurring occupations. Like, for example, um, you know, the, the history of the group, you know, the, the some knowledge of the culture would be in the stories and songs and things that are recorded and, and passed on in, in the rock art. Um, you know, I, I, think you know, I've heard that the, the Australian Aborigines consider the rock art that their culture has to be the most important thing that mankind ever has or ever will create, you know, which is a huge statement. But if you think about it, I mean, you know, that's, um, you know, all of their knowledge of the landscape and uh, when the rains come and, you know, where the different resources are to be found, where the springs are, um, animal behavior, who you are, where you come from, what your history is, what your obligations are to each other and to the land and to, to the universe. You know, it's your, it's your old farmer's almanac, it's your library of Congress, it's your Bible, it's everything rolled into one, the sum total experience and purpose of your culture. 
And uh, you know, what, what could be more important than that? And I, I imagine that's the kind of thing that we're looking at uh, here. But again, like I was saying with the, the calories, um, you know, I think, you know, people are, are returning to these sites periodically, there's, you know, maybe there's a, a ceremonial calendar related to particular sites, but, uh, you know, they're not going to be living permanently at, at any of them, uh, most likely. There might be some, you know, favored places to return to on, on certain occasions. Um, I mean, and certainly, I mean, like, for example, I mean, some of these sites that have, you know, middens that are just meters and meters and meters thick, you're you know, obviously being returned to over and over and over again. Um, but uh, that's going to be over a lot of time depth. All right, next question. Which proto-historic ethnic groups occupied the basin and has it been totally surveyed? Um, and I will say the basin is pretty broad and maybe Tim could uh, clarify, but maybe start with answering the Amistad, you know, the National Park Service property, that basin. Sure, right. And the, the, the yeah, and the, yeah. So the, we, we have not um, had a 100% survey. Um, there's still, you know, I feel like almost every time I go out to uh, check on this or that, uh, I'm discovering new burned rock middens and hearth fields and things. And uh, so that's always kind of fun. And, and every now and then when I get lucky, a new rock art site. So I know there's, there's definitely still stuff to, to discover. Um, we've not had a 100% survey. And um, in terms of uh, indigenous groups, of course, in uh, more modern times, uh, Apaches and Comanches were here. You know, you had um, Lieutenant Bullis out of uh, Fort Clark and Brackettville and uh, Fort Duncan down in Eagle Pass and the Seminole Negro Indian Scouts. Um, you know, this is, you know, 1870s Indian Wars period, you know, conducting operations against the Apaches and Comanches. Um, you know, but they were out here for, um, uh, you know, a long time. And then and before that, then you get into a number of other um, uh, named groups that, you know, but they're, they're not major groups that most people would recognize. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the, the Spanish recorded um, before the Apaches and Comanches move into the, into the area. But the, the, the main groups that we consult with, for example, would be uh, Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, um, Mescalero Apache, uh, kind of representing the Lipan Apache, and then um, um, I'm gonna say, yeah, Eagle Pass. Um, uh, I just, just based out on the, the Eagle Pass folks, but a uh, uh, handful. There's a wonderful volume that there's a PDF of it online that you can download for free. Where did it go? Um, it's the cool thing about doing this right in front of my library. Um, uh, can Matsu and Wade 2002 Ethnohistoric Study of Amistad Reservoir? Dang it. I was just moving stuff around in my library before the talk, and now I can't find it. But a fantastic uh, book that uh, you can. You can find, I'll, I'll send uh, Jimmy a link uh, to it uh, that you can send out to folks. Uh, you can download the PDF of it. It's a fantastic volume. All right. And Thank you. Um, so, all right, so there's a, there's a comment, kind of a comment question here. Uh, I'm working on a research project um, in university over repeat photography in, in Texas State Parks. I know there was a lot of salvage archaeology done before the creation of the reservoir. Do you know where I can find the photographs of when the land was being surveyed and the project was being done? I'm not looking for site-specific photos. I'm interested in landscape documentation. And, um, and that may be one, Jack, where you, know, uh, you might want to get back to me on that too. Yeah, yeah, that might be something. Uh, shoot me an email. I mean, certainly uh, a lot of the, the pre-reservoir, you know, all the, the records and things are curated at Tarl. Um, but so that'd be like a probably a park research request thing. So yeah, shoot me an email and uh, we can we can dig into that. Okay. Here's the, uh, can, I don't know if you guys can see me, but here's that uh, Kenmatsu and Wade, um, Amistad National Recreation Area, American Tribal Affiliation, Phase One Ethno Historic Literature Review, Kenmatsu and Wade, um, 2002. This is a fantastic document. 
and there's a PDF of it. Uh, you can you can download. Uh, you can find it online. And it's got uh, wonderful uh, synthesis of of a lot of the uh, uh, Spanish and U.S. military and and various uh, documentations of different groups in the region. All right, next question. Um, well, this is actually a comment. 4,000 years and we can still see the rock art that says a lot as most of our own modern human culture is in the cloud. Very true. And it makes me real nervous about all these digital photos I take. Um, <laughs> well, you know, one of the great things that's made that rock art uh, so well preserved is that all the pigments are made from minerals. So the reds and the yellows are you know, red ochre, yellow ochre, hematite, limonite, that sort of thing black you think maybe they'd be using charcoal but they're not there's an outcrop of manganese that's kind of out uh, between comstock and langtree and um they're they're using that that manganese to uh to create the black and then that's being ground up uh super super fine and mixed with uh, a binder probably animal fat and then um maybe a little bit of uh like a yucca root emulsifier and you get this uh wonderful paint and of course, you know, if you've ever seen uh, like a, a rusty barbed wire fence that stained the rock underneath it orange, uh, you can imagine if you're applying the sort of a basically rust based paint onto limestone, it, it, uh, it, it preserves really, really, really well. So we're, we're, we're lucky that they chose to express themselves this way as opposed to say with limericks or something and we'd, we'd never have any, any trace of it. Okay, got another question, kind of a follow-up here. Were they all under the umbrella of the Coaltecans, like the Carrizo Cumacrudo? I don't know. Okay. How's that? Okay. Um, what is the availability of guided tours in and around the park? How accessible by boat and road? Okay, so within Amistad National Recreation Area right now, it is very poor. Um, because of low lake levels, you know, when the lake is high, you can launch a motorboat at the Pecos River boat ramp and it's seven river miles downstream to Panther Cave, it takes about 15 minutes. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, right now, uh, you can't launch anything but maybe a canoe at Pecos boat ramp and even then you're going to get super muddy if you do. Mm -hmm. um, and even if you did get down to Panther Cave, there's a big silt dam that's uh, blocking the mouth of the canyon. So uh, Panther Cave is just inside the mouth of where Seminole Canyon flows into the Rio Grande. And uh, or across the mouth of Seminole Canyon, it's silted in about 40 feet deep. And this silt dam rises up out of the, uh, what's left of the water and has salt cedar and uh, you know, willows and things growing up on it and uh, can't get a boat across. So, um, uh, this is not the best year to try to visit those sites through the park, but um, Seminole Canyon State Park always offers tours of Fate Bell Rock Shelter on um, uh, what is it Wednesdays through Sundays at uh, 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock. I'll, uh, I'll send Jimmy an email with a whole bunch of uh, uh, contacts for uh, tours and things to do in this area, things to see, and, um, you know, like, yeah, what ways to see the rock art out here. One of the, the, the neatest treats out here is every now and then the Witte Museum, because uh, they, they kind of, uh, they're the heirs of the Rock Art Foundation, which merged into them in 2018. Um, they've got special permission with some landowners and uh, they'll lead tours on to some really neat sites that are back on private land that are you know, normally not accessible. And when those tours come open, that's, that's, a, that's a real treat. Um, another one of my favorites is the, uh, you know, if you're in for a, a more rigorous hike, the uh, Presa Canyon tour at Seminole Canyon State Park is about a, you know, eight mile all day thing. You see half dozen or so different rock art sites, a couple of different styles, and you're going through this big boulder strewn canyon with little spring fed trickles flowing through the bottom of it. And, uh, you know, the walls are, uh, you know, shaped by millennia of flash floods and has kind of this sculptural skate park kind of look to it and it's just a fantastic height um but anyway, and I'll, I'll send some links to that too all right um 
I don't see any further questions in the chat. Do we have any uh, any other questions from the floor? Anybody? I can put another one in the chat if you want. We got a little bit of time. Well, uh, well, I think we uh, we we uh, we asked Jack plenty of questions, and and you did a really good job uh, fielding all those. You know, you've you clearly work with the public a lot. You know, in your service with the National Park Service, and you, you know, formerly working for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and it's a uh, it's a tremendous amount of information to uh, to try to to manage out there with uh, as much archaeology as, as as you have. You know, it's it's not quite the same everywhere in Texas. So, uh, you know, folks are going to ask a lot of questions that cross um, all all over the place. So, uh, I appreciate that. No, you bet. Keeps me on my toes, and it's fun. Um, well, Jack, thank you so much. A terrific program. And um, I want to uh, uh, wish everybody a, a, a good evening and thank you for joining us. And we will see everybody at next month's meeting, uh, the May meeting. So y'all have a, have a great night. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.